And finally, we've made it to the last glucose chunk of biochemistry. Uh, the next three lectures will focus on the metabolism of amino acids, completely different topic for us, and then we wrap up with photosynthesis as well. And so this really is it for eukaryotic, or at least mammalian, glucose. Uh, this is the last bits of chapter 18, and we will tie up quite a few loose ends here, specifically talking about how the different glucose <coughs> metabolism pathways in a single cell are tied together, and then thinking even bigger and talking about how glucose metabolism is tied together within multi-organ systems like our own and within entire organisms. So if we're going to be tying multiple pathways together, what we're really talking about is controlling overall carbohydrate metabolism within a single cell. Glucose is the one common unifying factor holding everything that we've talked about for the past four plus weeks together. Whether we're discussing glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, the citric acid cycle, the synthesis and breakdown of glycogen, at its core for all of those pathways is glucose. In fact, some of these pathways are reversals of each other. Gluconeogenesis is essentially the reversal of glycolysis. The synthesis of glycogen is essentially the reversal of glycogen breakdown. And so glucose is kind of cycling through these pathways throughout the cell. So with glucose being so central to metabolism in general and so central to all of these pathways specifically, and in addition, uh, having these opposite or opposing pathways almost fighting with each other, the question really becomes, how is it all controlled? How does a cell know where to send glucose, what to do with glucose, and how does a cell not get stuck in kind of an infinite loop where glycolysis occurs and it's followed by gluconeogenesis, and glycolysis occurs and it's followed by gluconeogenesis? How do cells know not to get stuck in the rat's wheel of glucose to pyruvate to glucose to pyruvate to glucose to pyruvate? And that's what we'll talk about here. Got a bit ahead of myself there. Well, part of what protects the cell from doing this is that these individual pathways are, are tightly regulated, they're tightly controlled, and they're often compartmentalized. They're occurring in different physical locations throughout the cell. And so by keeping them separate, both physically and from a regulation point of view, we can kind of stop these infinite loops from occurring. So let's take the big picture view and talk about some of the key enzymes that are controlling carbohydrate metabolism and what those control signals are. Now we're going to introduce a new molecule here, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Not fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, not the intermediate of glycolysis, but fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And fructose 2,6-bisphosphate as a molecule plays a huge role in the regulation and control of overall glucose metabolism. First off, a cell's ability to make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate depends exclusively on available energy stores. Making this molecule, the presence of this molecule, is how the cell determines and keeps track of its overall energy levels. And to put a little bit more meat on those bones, counterintuitively, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is made only when energy slash ATP levels begin to get low. So this is your oh no molecule. This is your oh crap molecule. This is the molecule that the cell makes when it starts to get worried about energy starvation. Here's what the molecule looks like, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. We have one phosphate group on carbon 2 and one phosphate group on carbon 6. This molecule activates phosphofructokinase, that's PFK, the enzyme that catalyzes step 3 of glycolysis, and that makes some sense. If we do the opposite inference, when energy levels are low, the cell makes fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, and the presence of that molecule triggers step 3 of glycolysis to occur so that energy levels can then climb again. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate also inhibits fructose bisphosphate phosphatase. We've seen that before. That sounds pretty familiar. Fructose, well, let me give it its full name, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. That's the enzyme which we just learned about as being important in gluconeogenesis. This is the enzyme that reverses step 3 of gluconeogenesis. So the presence of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate means that energy levels are low. And if energy levels are low, you should not be doing gluconeogenesis. If energy levels are low, do not push pyruvate back to glucose. Push pyruvate to the PDC and on to the citric acid cycle so that energy can be made. So we're essentially turning gluconeogenesis down in the presence of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate because the presence of this molecule means that energy levels are low.
So we can distill that down by saying when fructose 2,6 bisphosphate levels are high, glycolysis is activated, and when glucose uh, 2,6 bisphosphate levels are low, gluconeogenesis is activated. In other words, when energy levels are high, we do gluconeogenesis, and when energy levels are low, we do glycolysis. Makes perfect sense. It's exactly what we want the cell doing. Another key cellular control point for all of glucose metabolism is step 10 of glycolysis, namely the enzyme pyruvate kinase. Pyruvate kinase is not only responsible for regulating glycolysis as a pathway, it's inhibited by ATP, we've talked about that to death, uh, it's activated by fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. We mentioned that as well in a challenge question. That keeps glycolysis from backing up. If the first half of glycolysis is going quickly, then we want the second half of glycolysis to go quickly as well. Well, when, fruct uh, when phosphofructokinase or PFK levels are inhibited, we stop gly glycolysis at step 3. That causes a backup of step 2 and step 1. As glucose 6-phosphate levels climb, that inhibits hexakinase, and when hexakinase shut down, glycolysis shuts down entirely. Glucose can no longer be used for glycolysis. Free glucose levels start to climb, and that triggers the synthesis of glycogen so that that excess glucose can be stored. So you start to get the idea that everything we've been building to all these weeks really represents a constant and dynamic crosstalk and backtalk between multiple pathways. Different pathways are literally speaking to each other in a biochemical way, giving each other an idea of where they lie in the pathway. Are they going fast? Are they going slow? Are their intermediate levels high? Are their product levels high? And also keeping tabs on overall energy levels through primarily ATP levels. And so as one system shuts down, another system activates to absorb the excess uh, reactant that's there, and vice versa is true as well. So pretty amazing how complex and robust the cellular communication is with pathways like this so that none of these balanced pathways get out of whack. And the same is true on a larger perspective. The same kind of thing in general, in principle, is happening among different organs of our entire body. So we'll close with that. Large, complex organisms, such as ourselves, don't only have to compartmentalize their activities in a cellular way, we can actually compartmentalize activities in an organ system way. We can divide the chores of carbohydrate metabolism among different organ systems to make it more efficient. And one such system that does this is called the Cori cycle. The Cori cycle is essentially a cycle of metabolic intermediates between the liver and the muscle. Glucose metabolism specifically is cycled between these two cell types. Glyco glycolysis occurs primarily in the muscle, and gluconeogenesis occurs in the Cori cycle, primarily in the liver. The idea is that during strenuous exercise, as glucose levels uh, are used up and cells become anaerobic in the muscle, those muscle cells begin doing the anaerobic version of glycolysis and they convert glucose into lactate and a net profit of two ATP molecules. As that lactate begins to build up in muscle cells, it's going to be cytotoxic. Muscle cramps will develop, but at even higher levels of lactic acid, those muscle cells will start to die. So the muscle cells offload that lactic acid into the blood. The blood then carries that lactate to the liver. And the liver, being the filter of all things bad in the blood, absorbs that lactate from the bloodstream. In the liver, that lactate is converted to pyruvate in a single redox reaction. Lactate is oxidized to pyruvate, and NAD plus is reduced. Once pyruvate is made in the liver, then gluconeogenesis can take over, and glucose is made. That glucose, that free glucose, is released into the bloodstream at the liver, and where do you think it goes? It goes to those hungry, starving muscle cells that made the, lactic, the lactate in the first place. So in the muscle cells, that glucose is converted into pyruvate, and then that pyruvate eventually uh, anaerobically converted into lactate. That lactate offloaded to the blood, carried to the liver, and the liver processes that lactate to pyruvate, and gluconeogenesis makes glucose. That glucose goes back to the muscle cells, and this cycle, this Cori cycle, repeats again and again and again. So we see this division of labor approach, this compartmentalization, where the metabolism of glucose occurs in the muscle, and the metabolism of lactate occurs in the liver. Pretty interesting stuff.
So to summarize this last chunk, we started off talking about our main signaling molecule, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which is only made when energy levels begin to drop. That activates PFK so that glycolysis can speed up, and it inhibits fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase so that gluconeogenesis can slow down or stop. After talking about the cellular components of glucose metabolism and its regulation, we went on to tell the quick story of the Cori cycle as an example of how entire organisms regulate glucose metabolism as well. As well. And here it was the idea that there is glucose in the muscle that is metabolized all the way to lactic acid when those muscle cells are anaerobic. That lactic acid is then put into the bloodstream, carried to the liver, the lactate converted into pyruvate, the pyruvate converted into glucose by gluconeogenesis, and then back to the muscle that glucose goes to repeat the process again. So that is it, folks. That is it for sugars. We will see glucose again at the very, very end of photosynthesis in the very, very last lecture. But for all intents and purposes, our next and last three lectures of this course will be spent on topics other than glucose metabolism.